Um, I'm glad to introduce Ali Begin, who you probably saw a lot and heard uh, even more uh, with um, his tuto uh, tutorial about adaptive streaming. <clears throat> so good morning everybody. Uh, we are all familiar with all these uh, logos over here. Right. I'm just going to put this in my pocket. All right. So well, all the talk is going to be about algorithms and formats for adaptive streaming. Uh, uh, I've been doing uh, this type of work uh, for a long time. That's uh, what my PhD thesis was about. And uh, since 2006, I've been you know, working in different industries uh, for this uh, same topic. And then a couple of uh, warnings. Uh, well, uh, there will be a lot of educational content on this one, uh, but there will be some people who might get upset with uh, some of the content I will be showing. Uh, because there are some technologies that are dead now, but I wanted to include them just because they were important at some point in time. So really listen at your own risk, OK? So we were discretion is advised. <laughs> So, uh, <clears throat> just a very uh, short, brief introduction for myself. Uh, I come from a country called Turkey. Uh, I know it's uh, pretty much on the news all the time, uh, for better or worse. Uh, I was born in Konya, which is a really uh, old town, actually. People have been living there for about uh, 5,000 years. Uh, we have so many graveyards and uh, things like that. So, it was a capital for uh, Selçuk's uh, before the Ottomans in the region. Right. So I went to school, uh, electrical engineer in Bilkent University, and then I came to Atlanta, Georgia to get my PhD. Which, any Georgia Tech people? Uh, yeah. Uh, when I was there, uh, we never won against the uh, Bulldogs, unfortunately, but yeah, that was really bad. I did a nine-month internship in San Diego, Qualcomm, so uh, I still have a lot of friends over there. And then once I finished uh, my PhD, I started working in Bay Area for Cisco. And then a couple of years in Bay Area, and then about uh, four or five years in Toronto, and then a couple of more years in Turkey. I moved back to get married, which I did in 2013. And then, believe it or not, we had over 2,000 <laughs> guests. Uh, I only need like maybe a couple of hundred, but uh, uh, that's the traditional way of getting married in my hometown. And then, uh, in two years ago, I also got a faculty position. Uh, not just because I love teaching, but I also like uh, working with students. And uh, I just got my tenure a couple of months ago, so I'm good to go uh, for the rest of my life, I hope. Um, and then, uh, yes, that's, uh, you know, besides the university, I'm doing mostly consulting work, and right now I'm consulting for Comcast. But today I'm going to be talking about mostly uh, stuff out of, uh, outside of Comcast. We are going to cover a couple of things, basics, uh, about, uh, you know, how we deliver content, over the internet. Just a couple of, uh, you know, overview slides on impact dash because we will have other talks later on uh, today. And then I would like to talk a couple of advanced algorithms uh, uh, where we can uh, do some better stuff with uh, adaptive streaming. So first, obviously, uh, a couple of definitions, download versus streaming, right? The first thing, the first method to be uh, obviously, besides using a torrent or peer-to-peer -peer network or uh, just a HTTP download, you know, the, the biggest uh, improvement over uh, download and play uh, process was progressive download, right? Here, what you will do is, it's an HTTP server, you have an HTTP client like browser, you send a request for a content, and then you get a single response which has the entire content, right, whatever you would like to watch audio, video, you know, uh, whatever, or all multiplexed in a single file. The nice thing here is it's a very simple protocol. It uses the same basic HTTP protocol. You get the, you send a request, you get the response, right? So if you look at the older YouTube, uh, you know, uh, media timeline, what would happen is that you would have, let's say here, we have uh, content for two minutes, 21 seconds, right? So as soon as I go to the website, I click on play, it will start downloading the content. You know, this red bar over here shows the portion that was downloaded already. Uh, uh, actually, it's playing. This gray bar is uh, showing the portion that was downloaded already. 
and the remaining part is still to be downloaded, right? So as soon as I have enough data in my buffer, which is about uh, 30 seconds or so in most uh, cases, you start the playback. So you don't need to wait for the entire content to be downloaded to start the playback, right? Now, the server is pretty agnostic. It's a, just a plain HTTP server, so it will just uh, send you the file as soon as it can. So download will continue as quickly as possible. In the meantime, maybe you're just still playing uh, somewhere around here, but you will get the whole content downloaded. Well, if you have downloaded this much uh, portion of the content, that's where you are able to seek. You know, you can go back and forth, you know, uh, you know, rewind and so on. But you cannot really go beyond this point because you haven't downloaded so. And you cannot just uh, jump frames. Uh, that wasn't really possible in uh, progressive download. Now, that was okay for uh, many people, but then, you know, that, you know, as people have changed their weaving patterns, uh, that wasn't really that efficient anymore. So we had to come up with better protocols for that. So just a very simple definition here, you know, as opposed to progressive download, we have uh, a concept of streaming. And streaming means it's a transmission of continuous content, audio video files, right, from a server to a client. And this part is important, is simultaneous consumption by the client. If you're gonna consume it later, that's not really a streaming process. And this definition implies two main characteristics. The consumption rate is gonna be limited by the real-time constraints, if you're watching, let's say, live linear content, as opposed to just bandwidth availability. Yes, you are stuck with your own bandwidth, but then there could be also some other limits on the server side or on the origin side. Also, the server transmission rate is gonna be uh, coupled to the client consumption rate. You cannot either, you know, overflow or underflow the client buffer. That's not what, you know, that's not the thing you wanna do. You wanna keep a healthy buffer status, sufficient amount of data in client's playback buffer, but you don't wanna overflow it or you don't wanna underflow it. Now, looking at the YouTube bar again, uh, not the progressive uh, download version, but it's just a streaming. You again click play, you start downloading stuff and then Playback is going to start very quickly, right? And then it will, uh, if you experiment with this on YouTube, it will continue downloading the content at a very fast pace to a certain amount of time. As soon as it has about a healthy buffer size of 30 seconds, 40 seconds, it will actually slow down and the server transmission rate is going to match your playback rate. Okay, so if this is a three megabit video and you're consuming the three megabit per second, the download is gonna be three megabit per second. The goal here is not to download entire video right away, even if you have the bandwidth, because maybe you're not gonna watch that uh, video, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in a full manner. So that really saves a lot of server resources and network resources. But different from the progressive download, here you can seek around, you can jump to the last minute, last second, or last 10 minutes. So it's not really necessary to keep uh, downloading the entire file to be able to uh, seek around. And that's the nice thing about YouTube, right? Uh, you know, they really wanted to see if people are watching just the 10 minutes, they didn't want to really waste all this uh, bits transmission in the network. So just as a recap, we used to have progressive download, the first days of YouTube. It enables playback, so we don't need to wait for the entire download to uh, finish, but then, uh, you know, server is pretty agnostic. And then, you know, uh, some sort of uh, streaming, pseudo streaming, we have media indexing, which will allow us to seek around, right? You know the byte ranges and uh, where they correspond in the media timeline. And then the server also paces the transmission according to the bit rate. And then what we have today is chunk streaming, you know, where you divide the content into smaller files, physical or virtual files, and then this allows you to not only do on-demand but also live content, because once you are generating the current chunk, you can always stream the earlier chunks that were generated a couple of seconds ago. And then also allows you to do add instruction, which is really neat. And then an obvious extension to this is what we exactly have today, adaptive streaming. If I have chunk streaming, I can simply generate multiple representations in different resolutions and bit rates, and then do adaptive streaming, which will uh, hopefully improve my experience with the system. So this is the overall workflow that we have today. We have the content ingest, 
live or pre-captured, off Blu-ray, doesn't matter. There's a multi-rate encoder or transcoder. Everything goes through this, and then you generate multiple versions. And then you package them, and you know it could be HLS, Dash, you know, CMF, whatever your favorite packaging format is. You put the files on the origin server, and then there could be a CDN, obviously, here. What we have is the same guy playing football, but we have four representations. So everything is stored over there. The client is, again, a simple HTTP client. Sending an HTTP GET request, get, uh, getting the response. Sending a HTTP GET request, getting the response. So the client is uh, trying to fetch these individual short media segments, a couple of seconds long, or maybe six seconds or 10 seconds long, right? And then it will put them in the playback buffer back to back. If you are careful in terms of how to package and uh, generate those segments, your transition from one segment to another is going to be pretty s smooth. Obviously, there could be resolution changes, quality changes, and all that, but at least your decoders are not going to fail. So the way this whole system works is you know, the intelligence is here. The server is a dump server. You send a request, you get the response, and then you play back the content. How quickly are going to start the playback or you know, how much data you're going to buffer, that all depends on the client implementation. So uh, putting uh, everything I said into text, what we are doing here with adaptive streaming over HTTP is really we are mimicking uh, streaming through short downloads. We are actually doing file downloading, but the files are so small, it looks like streaming to the client. So, uh, and uh, you know, since this is HTTP, we know who is requesting what at what time. We know who is watching what, right? So that really gives us the flexibility to track the streaming clients. Adaptation. Once we have multiple representations, that's really easy to adapt to what? Network conditions, device capabilities, all that stuff. So this is really where we would like to go. You know, I would like to be able to the, uh, watch the content I am paying for on any device, anywhere, anytime. Right. Improved quality of experience. Uh, we will see adaptive streaming is going to reduce your start stream start time, and then hopefully it will really avoid uh, uh, bufferings or stalls. So overall, the quality of experience should be better. And that's the expectation. And again, HTTP is everywhere. It works on a freaking uh, uh, smartphone or smart TV, on your Blu-ray, Xbox, everywhere, right? And that's not really blocked uh, pretty much anywhere in the world. It runs over TCP or over port 80, which is uh, you know pretty much always open. We have cheap CDN uh, infrastructure. You know, we can deliver a gigabyte of video for a couple of cents uh, in the in the world right now. So HTTP is there. Uh, we have this flexibility of adaptive streaming, and then uh, <clears throat> you know um, we do our best on the client side to get the best performance. So this is a slide. Uh, Red is showing legacy or that technology. You know it all started with Move about 2006. Uh, you know there's some Move. Maybe there are some folks who used to work for Move over here, but some of their stuff is still run, running in uh, Slinkbox. If you're one of those. Microsoft had smooth streaming, which is legacy now, uh, Adobe Flash, almost that, or maybe that. Uh, Adobe had another uh, technology called HTTP Dynamic Streaming, uh, which is already that. And then, obviously, Apple HLS is the elephant in the room. Uh, there is an RFC, informational RFC, which really doesn't carry much weight, but it's just an informational document, 8216. But then CMF came along, and then now uh, they are revising the RFC, right? They have to. Now, the standards, uh, we have Dash and CMF, and there will be further talks uh, today about these things. So obviously, once you package the content into multiple representations, you know, uh, you know, into several chunks, you really need to describe this information to the client somehow. The segment duration, what codec you used, what audio languages or subtitles are available, and where this content is. Is it on the server, it is on that server, or it's on multiple servers? All that kind of information is included in a file called manifest. There are different types of manifests in, you know, in the world. I'm here showing a Dash example. I'm going to show in a HLS example as well. So in Dash context, it's called media presentation description. It's MPD. Okay, so first, uh, you know, in a, it's an XML file, 
right? Uh, in, the, in, the, in the higher level, we have all these uh, things called periods. This is going to be used for uh, splicing arbitrarily con uh, the, you know, content uh, uh, like ads that are with the actual main content. So you might have a pre-roll and then some uh, sort of main content and a mid-roll and then post-roll kind of thing. In each period, you will have multiple adaptation sets. You can have one, but then there could be multiple as well, different video and audio. Depending on what you would like to watch and where you would like to watch it, you need to pick the right adaptation set and then where you know, that's, that's the content you are going to be fetching from, okay? You can uh, choose Italian audio, Turkish subtitle, or, you know, uh, you know uh, one of the uh, HEVC encoded versions or AVC, whatever. So this is selection for the components and tracks. In each adaptation set, you have multiple representations. Those are the different flavors I showed you earlier. Different resolutions, different bit rates, you can have whatever you would like to have. So, and this is for adaptation. In each representation, right, there will be a template or maybe it's a segment timeline kind of addressing, which will give you the actual addresses for these individual uh, representation segments. Like I have a base URL here, and then here is my template for the third representation, slash three slash dollar number dollar dot mp4, right? Those are the files where uh, I will be fetching from. And this is something uh, defined in Bash, and then we have all these media segments, initialization segments, uh, and uh, media segments, or self-initializing media segments, depending on how you create them. And then these are well-timed, so if you are seeking around, you will actually know which period you are supposed to go, and then you know which adaptation set you are supposed to be fetching, and then you decide on the representation, and then you pick the right media segment, and then you go exactly where you would like to go. That's, uh, and based on the base URL and template addressing, you get the full URL so that you can send an HTTP uh, request, okay? And that works with any kind of plain HTTP server. Now, looking at the HLS version of the manifest, which is a human readable uh, you know, text file, there's a master M3 U8 file. Uh, it's kind of verbose, but uh, essentially it has uh, you know, the same codex information, same bandwidth resolution, all kinds of things. And these are the variants uh, that uh, will be referred to or described in a different uh, playlist. So I have, for example, this uh, uh, MT3 unit file, and then once I get the master file, I can also fetch this uh, playlist and see all these different uh, you know, media segments. Here I'm just showing transport stream segments, but now they also support uh, MP4. So it has the uh, segment duration and all that. So again, you know where to go if you are seeking around, okay? Um, uh, anything special? Well, there are a bunch of uh, tags defined here, and they are pretty much uh, you know, all defined in Apple website or the RFC. And there are lots of different versions of uh, HLS now. I think they're on version seven or something, seven. And if you want to compare them, here's a good website. They keep it uh, updated, so you can uh, look at the different versions. So that's what the MPD provides. But then looking at the practical MPDs, uh, depending on which MPD or manifest you are looking at, you will see different numbers. But here are just a couple of examples. So eight years ago, Vancouver Winter Olympics, Four years ago, uh, Sochi, Russia, and then just this year, uh, Pyeongchang in Korea, right? So, you know, different resolutions, bit rates. As you can see, there have been an increase in the number of representations offered. And then obviously the resolutions, 4K, 60 frames per second. You know, obviously not all these representations are going to be available to us, you know, all the devices. But then, you know, uh, this is what the service providers are trying to uh, you know, uh, what they are doing uh, to keep their customers happy. You still need these uh, pretty lousy quality representations because you might be on a uh, slow network. It doesn't really give you much, but still it's something, right? And uh, those are the, obviously, the most popular, uh, the middle ones are the most popular uh, representations. If you look at Amazon Prime today, Prime Video, you will see 20 plus representations for a single content. And uh, that's how they are doing it. Uh, so, HTTP adaptive streaming, again, the clients are smart, they send a request, and the server is dumped, just, you know, sends a response back. There are a couple of different optimizations over here, which you can do, you know, uh, 
I, I, there's a talk over this as well. If you want to use multicast, sort of, you know, more efficient distribution, there are a couple of things that you can do over here. But let's assume it's a unicast connection, request and response. So what the client is doing, it has a manifest. That's the first thing you do, right? And then. Uh, Obviously, we are running an operating system, iOS, Android, or Windows, Mac, whatever. So there is already an HTTP stack in your platform. And then there is already a transport protocol layer stack, uh, TCP or Quake as well. So we are going to be utilizing those things. And then the client is going to uh, use some decryption if the content is encrypted as well. Uh, but that's not really always the case. And then, most importantly, the client is continuously monitoring and measuring you know, the size of the current play, play, play up buffer. How much data I have in my buffer, right? That's very important. If you're running out of data in your buffer, you gotta do something about it. If you have too much data in your buffer, then you might take a bit more risks, okay? Not just in terms of bytes, but also in terms of seconds. You need to monitor your chunk download times. If it is taking two seconds to download a two second segment, that's more or less fine. But if it is taking 12 seconds to download a two second segment, you are really in big trouble. Also, you need to watch out for your CPU, memory, screen size, window size, all that stuff. If you have a tiny screen, there's really no point in downloading a 4K content. And that's obvious. Maybe you have the bandwidth, maybe you have the CPU, but maybe something is going on uh, with the decoder and you are dropping some frames. In that case, maybe you also need to slow down or maybe switch to a lower resolution. Something is not really working very well. Based on all this, it's the magic. The client is going to perform adaptation and is going to decide what to ask from the server or which server or which representation. All those questions are going to be decided by the client. And then equally importantly, we need to get some analytics data of this client or of this CDN or the server so that we can track what the clients have been doing and uh, what kind of uh, problems they have faced so that we can fix them. Now, as you can imagine, there are uh, this is not a very easy problem to solve. It sounds really easy, but uh, there are a lot of parameters that the client needs to use to optimize against. First of all, every client is selfish. They would like to improve their own quality. They don't really care about the client sitting next to you. If you are in a household, if you are watching a football game on your TV, you really don't care about your wife's streaming quality in the kitchen or the kids' uh, streaming quality in the basement, right? And then stability, that's also equally important. Just improving the overall quality doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, oh, half of the time the quality was great, but then sometimes the quality wasn't really that good. Some people are really nervous and picky about this concept. You know, they really would like to have some sort of uh, fixed quality over time. And then if you are watching sports or, you know, a major live event, you would like to be as close as possible to the live point. You don't want to miss a penalty or you don't want to miss a you know, red card, that sort of thing, right? At the same time, if you are trying to increase all these things or getting closer to the lie point, well, you are risking yourself to get a stall, which is like media just stops because you ran out of data and your network is not sufficient to get you data in time. And I maybe uh, your seeking time or zipping time, channel change time is gonna really increase. If you wanna really make them short, you got to give up on some of those things. I mean, that's the trade-off. And how we are going to strike out the right balance? Well, that's really the critical point here. So let's look at some issues over, uh, you know, what issues we see in the, in the field. Streaming over HTTP, I remember 2008. This is the first time I was looking at this problem. Uh, you know, at Cisco, our customers are service providers, like Comcast. It's not like, uh, you know, people who are using Netflix. So, um, when a lot of people start using this kind of technology, the obvious question was, what's, what's going to happen in the access and aggregation networks? You know, how we are going to be able to, or how our customers are going to be able to cope with this much data traffic, uh, especially in the prime time. People were really implying that, well, HTTP is highly scalable, which is true. And then, uh, you know, video is just an ordinary web content, like an image file, MP3 file, or text file, HTML, CSS, doesn't matter. And it runs over TCP. That's the friendliest protocol you can ever, f you know, find on the face of the world, right? 
that has been tested since before I was born, I guess. Right? Everybody knows it has congestion avoidance reliability. It doesn't require any special settings for video. So the combination of HTTP and TCP should work just fine. Right? That was everybody's hypothesis. Right? So everything is fine. Well, we started doing a couple of experiments. And uh, very soon we realized that it just really doesn't work where, you know, in most cases. If you are the only guy who is doing streaming in this room at this time, maybe you will get away with this. And if you are doing Netflix at 3 a.m. in the morning, you will probably get away with this as well. But if you are competing with a bunch of other clients in your area, like in the same Wi-Fi network, in the same Starbucks shop or Apple Store, free Wi-Fi, all that stuff, right? Things are going to fall, uh, fall apart very quickly. The streaming clients, since they are adaptive, they are not just adapting based on their own conditions, but whatever you do is going to impact others. And uh, you are going to change your behavior accordingly. But then your change behavior is going to impact them as well. So there is a, a, a negative feedback loop over here, uh, which is uh, if you have taken the control theory cl class, which I haven't taken, supposedly it's an unstable system. So it can go anywhere in the, uh, you know, in the region. So if you are running uh, multiple Netflix clients or Xfinity clients in the same household, you might get into this trouble if your access bandwidth is limited. Equally importantly, which was more important for us at the time, the ISP access and aggregation links were the main culprit. Because a lot of people are just uh, you know, streaming Netflix, which is really consuming bandwidth all the time. That's going to put a lot of pressure. Usually, all these ISPs, they sell the same bandwidth to a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, for uh, obviously to lower the prices. You know, if you have a gigabit pipe, you still sell 100 megabit service to 100 people or sometimes even 1,000 people, not just 10 people. Because you know that the utilization needs to be higher to make profit out of that link. And then stadiums, shopping malls, all that. So you are going to face that problem ev everywhere. So just a couple of examples, uh, you know, I would like to show here. We scripted a very simple client at the time. You know, uh, this is a test almost 10 years old now. So we have aggressive clients, we have conservative clients. Aggressive means they're able to, you know, uh, you know try, they are trying to stream at a higher rate as long as, you know, they can uh, support 90% of the rate they will be asking for, which is very aggressive. And the conservative clients ca can only ask for our you know, uh, that specific bitrate if the available bandwidth is 1.9, so 20% overhead or 20% slack on the, on the channel. So we have 100 clients sharing 100 megabit link. To, you know, we have all kinds of different representations over here. You know, 200 uh, kilobit per second, 300, almost 5, 7, 9. This is pretty close to uh, a megabit per second. 100 megabits, 100 clients. What you would expect is to have pretty much all the clients over here, right? Here is what happens. If you have only aggressive clients, most of them, almost 70% of them, are going to stick with uh, 700 kilobit per second. About 30% of them are going to get you know, more decent quality. And there are a couple of losers over here, uh, yeah. <laughs> right, which are really struggling to keep up with the uh, uh, quality. Now, if you repeat the same experiment with the conservative clients, here's what you get. So, you know, the 700 kilobit per second is still the most popular. It's about 40%. Now, uh, you know, 30% of, you know, this could be like a noise margin. It's still uh, close to one megabit per second, and there are still quite a bit uh, uh, losers over here. So, what is this graph telling us? Any idea? Based on this, would you like to be an aggressive client or a conservative client? Huh? How many people say aggressive? How many people say conservative? Okay. Well, I'll show you the next slide because it looks like we have a we have a 50/50 distribution over here. So. Aggressive clients uh, are actually fairer to each other. That's the most important observation here. Why? Because the uh, bitrate uh, variation is uh, smaller for the aggressive clients. So if everybody is aggressive in the same population, actually people seem to be more fair to each other. Now, simulating this term, 50% uh, aggressive, 50% uh, conservative, this is what we get. What is this telling us? Huh? 
the aggressive guys are really you know, getting a lot better quality, whereas the conservative guys are uh, pretty much a loser, right? I mean, look at the plots here. The, the 700 almost megabit, there is a significant difference. And uh, what's this percentage? 60% of them are getting really decent quality. Here, uh, only uh, almost 80% are getting, getting of the conservative clients are getting a worse quality. This is a very simple experiment. If you mix the population, things actually change very quickly. So obviously we will never have all conservative or all aggressive uh, uh, clients in our population. And depending on the mix sync ratio, 20, 80, 80 to 20, 50, 50, you're gonna see different plots over here. Overall, is it really a good idea to be aggressive all the time or conservative all the time? Well, aggressive clients are getting higher quality in this case, yes. But if everybody has this idea of being aggressive, it's going to help me. Well, uh, studies shown that, and we have shown that as well, everybody is going to lose, actually. So the first paper we published in 2011, uh, hello to our Microsoft guys over here. Uh, this was smooth streaming. Um, so uh, we asked for the code, but they didn't give us at that time. So we actually put it in a black box and then did all kinds of uh, tricks to get the behavior of this smooth streaming client. So this is the bandwidth regime we applied, 500 second experiment, which was actually longer, but I'm just showing the first 500 uh, seconds. So we gave the client uh, five megabit and then two and then five and then one. We wanted to see how the client was reacting. So the client started with a lower bitrate because it doesn't know what's going on in the network, asks for lower bitrate and then sees, okay, maybe I'll just uh, for a higher bitrate and so on. Here it is stuck, why? Because that's the highest uh, maximum bitrate available for our encoding. It's doing a bunch of uh, requests over here, back to back, why? Because it's trying to fill up the buffer. That's what we call buffer filling state. Please don't call it buffering state because buffering state means you actually ran out of data and you are trying to buffer the data. This is buffer filling state. The playback is still going on. And then when we reduce the bandwidth, yes, the client adapts but with a certain delay. And then when we increase the bandwidth, it adapts again, shifts up, and so on. So it's doing a you know, fairly uh, nice job. And then once the buffer is uh, filled up, about 40 you know, seconds or so, it's going to be in the state state where if you are consuming two seconds of chunks, you will be getting two seconds of chunks. So you keep the uh, 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 play, 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 play back for uh, size in a comfortable and healthy manner. These are the chunk throughputs. You start the timer when you send request. You stop the timer when you get the response. You know the response size, you divide it by the delta time, and that's the bandwidth you are going to measure. So we are giving the client 5 megabit per second, but it's not exactly measuring 5 megabit per second at all times. You can see sometimes it measures 4, sometimes it's 5. And here, there's nothing else in the network, so this is just a single client. Here it's doing a bit better job. It's not doing a good job over here, and so on. But that's still OK. You know, there could be some you know, other ongoing stuff inside the network. Our expectation, which we were never able to confirm with the Microsoft guys, was okay, maybe these guys are doing just a basic exponential moving average of the available uh, bandwidth or chunk throughput so that they can do the uh, adaptation. So this is that what this plot shows, and that's more or less following what the client is doing. So I guess we were in the right track. Now, we took the same client, and we put it in a different test. Ten clients. 10 identical clients running on a 10 megabit link, and this is what we get. I'm showing only three clients here, and as you can imagine, again, we would expect everybody to stick with something like 900, 950, or maybe even 850, but as you can see, they are running all over the place. They have no idea what's going on. They upshift, downshift, upshift, downshift. They cannot even decide where to stay, right? It's pretty you know, unstable. And uh, if you look at the other clients, it's the same. And there is no convergence. That's even worse. So if you keep this running for 10 hours, it's going to be like this for 10 hours. Is anybody willing to pay for this quality? Not really, right? I mean, this looks like a crap on TV if you want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you are doing a premium content, if you paid for this and that's what you get, you are going to get pretty upset. So why this was happening? That was the question. And then, the obvious answer, well, it wasn't really obvious at the time, but uh, it took a while for us to figure that out. The actual data transmission is happening in the TCP stack, which is out of your control. 
But what you are controlling is the HTTP layer, the client implementation, where you're doing this, all this adaptation. That's why we, where you are doing the request response based on the TCP throughput measurements, right? Or observed throughput measurements. But then the, again, the actual transmission is happening at the TCP layer, which uh, depends on many other things, not just your own request and response. So this is your inner control loop, TCP congestion rate control algorithm. And this is your adaptive streaming HTTP layer algorithm. Well, if you are two bosses in a company, you are guaranteed to fail, right? If there are two bosses, two control loops in the streaming platform, it's going to actually fail. Well, the situation is even worse because most of the time, streaming clients are talking to multiple servers or to the same server or multiple TCP connections, which are not uh, phase sharing, meaning that they are not really congest uh, uh, congestion state sharing. So the situation is even worse. You can have three or four control loops in this case. Now, one word on uh, multiple TCP connections, why some clients are doing this. It all started with MOVE. Uh, Sumit used to have only uh, two TCPs, HLS always uses one. So let's say we have three TCPs, okay? This is just like driving on a multi-lane highway instead of a single lane highway. So you have a fast car, you have streaming content. If there is a problem, there's a timeout or packet loss or a delayed acknowledgement in the TCP layer, you know, your rate is going to drop. You need to slow down on this lane. Well, if this is the only lane you got, you are going to be stuck there for a while. What we can do is that if you have an other ongoing a TCP connection that already passed the slow start phase, you can switch to that and keep requesting over that TCP connection. So you keep your pace, uh, pa uh, right pace and then Let's say you faced another timeout. Now we are stuck with slow start. Well, if you have another TCP, you can just keep going. Okay? So the idea is very neat. And Moon Networks was really uh, successful in implementing this. Now, most importantly, you need to take from this slide, which I'm going to come back. Well, TCP is only fair at flow level. If you have multiple TCPs, you are being unfair if you are just using that to, to get a higher share of the bandwidth. So just because TCP is fair at the flow level doesn't mean that you are going to get fair streaming. If you are using three TCPs as opposed to one TCP, you got to be really careful in terms of limiting your you know, uh, aggregated bandwidth to keep at the single TCP level. Otherwise, you are going to be unfair to, the, uh, to your neighbors or family members. Down same server, multiple TCPs, which we can use MPTCP, multiple TCP, or you can uh, have multiple servers and uh, multiple TCPs. Concurrent TCPs is a very uh, famous trick, which I just shown in the previous slide. It mitigates the head of line blocking. That's really important at the HTTP layer. And then it also, also allows you to fetch multiple subsegments in parallel. So you're not doing a single TCP transmission, but you divide the large segment into multiple parts, and then you are fetching them in parallel. And then also allows to quickly abandon a non-working connection without having to slow start any one. That's also very critical if you are running out of data in your buffer. Well, this has been proven very successful. But there is another uh, study that shows the system performance is going to deteriorate very quickly if more than 20% of the clients are going to be doing this trick in the population. So if you are the only guy doing this, you are good to go. But if there are other guys like you, well, it's going to really suck for everybody, okay? Now, a year later, we published another paper why TCP was impacting all this HTTP streaming. Well, you can look at the paper in detail, but here the main problem is the on periods of HTTP transmissions, right? When you send a request, you get the response, and then you are offline for a, f uh, for a short amount of time. Depending on how the on periods are overlapping or non-overlapping, your observation of the available throughput is going to be different. And you're not going to be stuck in this uh, state forever. Well, if you observe the full capacity over here, because you're not sharing it with anybody else at this time, you are going to try to get a larger bitrate, a larger segment. Then you will start expanding, and you will get to this state. And then once you, as soon as you detect a slowdown, you will go back to the state, and so on. So this is a cycle. It's a vicious cycle. And unfortunately, that's inherent to TCP. The clients, streaming clients, cannot really figure out how much bandwidth to use or what bandwidth to request from the server unless they use too much. So they need to overshoot first, 
upshift really to a high bit, uh, bit rate representation, then they can understand, oh, maybe that was too much. I need to slow down, okay? The paper has all the details. Well, once you know the problem, you can solve the problem. How we can fix this problem? Well, we can either fix the clients, which we did it, with our PEND algorithm. There was another uh, proposal, BOLA. There are uh, tons of algorithms in the field. Uh, there's an ACM SIGCOM paper from last year, uh, MIT guys, called Pensive. They are using machine learning. And uh, you know uh, our MMSIS paper this year, which won the best paper award, uh, so a game theory, we are using a game theory uh, solution to you know, fix the clients. And then another option is you can try to fix the HTTP TCP stack, but that's not really easy because that's not really in your uh, uh, control. That's usually uh, something comes from the operating system. We will have a quick talk in the afternoon or maybe right after the lunch. Uh, there are some you know, uh, nice results over there, so you don't need to use TCP all the time. HTTP can use any protocol as long as it's reliable. So that's also another misbelief that people have. HTTP always comes with TCP. Well, if you don't know, the, uh, if you don't know how to fix the client or if, you are, if they are not under your control, for example, you cannot really change how the iOS clients behave. We can ask that question to Josh later on, but that's what the Apple gives to you. If they re really suck in implementing a client, well, they suck, right? And there's nothing we can do about it. Well, maybe in that case we can fix the problem on the network side or the server side. You can use software-defined networking, some sort of quality of service techniques um, to get this done. Well, that's not an easy or inexpensive solution. The third option is enable a control plane, which is a standardized solution in MPEG dash, part five, server and network assisted dash. Well, I'm not gonna get into that, but that's also another neat solution. Now, one thing I can suggest you to do is, we just, uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, good survey papers accepted a couple of weeks ago. It's gonna appear in IEEE communications surveys and tutorials. Uh, I have the, uh, you know, not the final version, but I have a draft, I can share it with you. It is a pretty long read, it's over almost 30 page, uh, double column paper, and it's referring to and studying about 200 studies in this field. Once we opened the gate in 2011 with our MMSIS paper, there were tons of you know, studies looking at this problem. How are we gonna fix all these solutions in adaptive streaming? You know, proprietary solutions, Markov decision process. No, this is not the MD, MPD from Dash. This is Markov decision process, SDN and all that. So you can really have a look at for details over there. Uh, just one slide to summarize that paper. Neither of these solutions is the perfect thing. Unfortunately, they all, all, always come with a you know, different problem. The, fixing the clients is easy, but again, if you don't control the clients, there's really not much you can do. The server-based uh, origin server or CDM-based solutions, well, sometimes they are gonna require custom servers. That's gonna be expensive as well. Uh, Network-assisted or uh, SDM-based solutions, well, they are not really that practical at this point. Uh, uh, they really look nice on the paper, but they're not really that practical uh, in the network. This is a slide I sl stole from Thomas. Well, he's the only one who's stealing stuff. So, uh, you know, why latency is important? If you are a soccer fan, right? You know, the live, the satellite, or the cable broadcast might be showing the goal, whereas if you are streaming, especially over HLS, you could be really 45 seconds behind the live point. So uh, that's really a big problem for a lot of people. Not for me, I really don't care, but for a lot of people, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a big problem. I'd rather, you know, you know, can watch it like a couple of minutes behind. I don't care, I really want decent quality over latency. Uh, Latency is a really important topic, and I believe Thomas is gonna cover this in detail, but you know, there are a lot of things that contribute to latency. You know, the encoding pipeline, the ingest and packaging, you know, it's, it's, I don't, they're not really uh, uh, zero time. Network propagation delays, something you cannot uh, really do much about. CDM buffer delays, media segment duration, and then the play, player behavior. Obviously, most of the problems are over here. If you fix your player, then you might really be able to reduce the latency. So current implementations, if you are wondering what's happening in the field, uh, yes, 
similar to the legacy technology, but there's a significant deployment out there. If you are using a two second uh, frag fragment segment, usually the smooth delay is about 10 seconds. Dash, uh, you can get the same performance or even better. And the HLS, uh, well, until a couple of years ago, 10 seconds was the norm, right? Uh, and that would cause extra 30 seconds of delay because they're always buffering at least three segments. And then since then, they switched to six second segments. So that's a bit improvement, right? And then if you're running your iPhone, uh, Safari so on your iPhone, there's an auto start feature for live stream. So as soon as you go to the website, it will start uh, quickly at least more quickly. You don't need to go there and click. And then if you are doing an application, there are still some App Store or iOS Store uh, regulations uh, which will ask you to use six second segments. You cannot really say that I want to use uh, one second segments. Uh, maybe Josh may also have. You actually can. You can? It's just a, it's a guideline, but it's not. It's problem. not mandatory? Correct. Okay, I stand correct. Okay. Okay. One and two second deployments. Okay, so it's not a problem. All right, perfect. OK, strike that out. Uh, <laughs> OK, uh, a couple of slides on MPEG Dash. Dynamic adaptive streaming over HTTP. It's a standard since 2012. We started working on it in 2010. What the standard is calling is you know, the manifest format, the MPD media presentation description, and how we are going to parse it, and then how we are going to parse the media segments. That's really about the media and the media segments and the MPD format. Anything else is out of scope for uh, uh, MPEG Dash. You know, uh, we don't really care about the adaptation logic. Yes, there are lots of different implementations out there, but that's not really something that the standard is defining. And then HTTP 1.1, you can use HTTP 2, you can use anything else you want. MPT transport is also not specified. Uh, so what, where we are right now, just two weeks ago, we were in the MPEG meeting. So right, we have seven parts at this point in the standard. The most important was, is, uh, is obviously part one, which defines the presentation, uh, media presentation uh, description, as well as the media segment profiles. We have four amendments, where we are, which are going to be you know, aggregated to third edition, which Thomas finished editing a couple of weeks ago. So that's good to go. But now we have amendment five which means you know, a couple of new features are coming to Dash, and uh, that's work in progress. Part two is conformance and reference software. We have the second edition published last year. Third edition implementation guidelines. It's an old document. The third edition is in uh, uh, progress, which I'm supposed to be editing, but I guess what I'm gonna just say, don't read the first two editions, uh, that's <laughs> because the first two editions are pretty old at this point. The fourth edition is about segment level encryption. Part five, server and network assisted dash, published last year. Part six, dash over full duplex HTTP. If you are using WebSockets or HTTP server push from HTTP2, that's what you need to implement. And part seven, which is the only part that hasn't been published yet, that's using uh, Dash to deliver CMF uh, uh, content. So that's gonna be an informative document is, which is in progress. Uh, yes, from the week uh, earlier, these are the technologies under consideration that we are looking into. So these may or may not go into the next amendment, which uh, may or may not be included in the next edition. So these are just still some you know, ongoing work over here. So checking the time, uh, I'll try to be quick in the last few minutes. A, a couple of slides on QAE. Depending on where you are coming from, QAE is an entirely different concept. For video coding people, streaming people, and uh, you know, uh, for artistic people, it's all different. So it really depends how we are going to define it. It's just a bunch of definitions here: ABR, CBR, VBR, CAP, VBR, title-based encoding, context-aware encoding. We used to do all CBR. Now we are slowly moving to you know CAP, VBR, and maybe in the future we will do something else. But that's what we are uh, currently focusing on. You know, you will have some VBR encoding in your. Uh, uh, content generation, which will give you hopefully better quality, but then dealing with it on the client side is a uh, main issue. Famous picture from Netflix that shows the importance of title-based encoding. Well, duh, right? I mean, everybody knows this. Uh, again, maybe before I was born. Uh, so not every content is uh, having the same R&D curve. So some contents are going to be more sensitive to bitrate increase or reduction that some others want. So you really got to pick your 
bitrate ladder, you know, which resolutions and bitrates you need to use for this content fairly carefully. But what we are looking for is fairness in quality, not really fairness in bitrate. Everybody talks about fairness in bitrate when they actually say fairness, but that's not what we are after. If I am watching a soccer game again in my 65-inch TV, I really deserve more bandwidth than my kids or my wife who is watching a stupid show. When I Does anybody disagree? <laughs> right? So, uh, something Alex showed yesterday, not all segments are the same because of complexity, moving head versus running man, right? So you gotta really uh, spend more bits on more complex segments. Instead of equal bitrate allocation, we wanna do consistent quality, which means different bitrate allocation for different segments. Now, uh, very quickly, if this is your encoding, you know, these are segments and that uh, the text in the boxes, they show how difficult or easy, you know, uh, uh, to encode that segment. If you are doing CBR, doesn't matter, you are gonna be doing more or less the same bitrate, using the same bitrate. That's also, again, another Apple requirement if you are running a, on an HLS device. That used to be an Apple requirement, actually. The only flexibility you got was 10%. So if it, the average bitrate is two megabit per second, you can go as much as a 2.2 megabit per second or as low as 1.8. If that's the case, what you're gonna get is, yes, segment sizes are gonna be pretty constant, but the quality is gonna vary a lot. If it is an easy segment, the quality is gonna be really good, but if it's a difficult segment, the quality is gonna really suck. And even if you keep streaming at two megabit per second, which you think should provide uh, consistent quality, you are gonna get varying quality and it might upset you, okay? And uh, studies have shown that if there is something worse than watching a video at low quality, it is to watch it with varying quality. Many people are sensitive about this topic. Now, if you encode it in a more subtle fashion, which I'm showing here, so EC segments consume only small bits and difficult segments use more bits, what I'm gonna get is uh, the average encoding bitrate is gonna be more or less the same, but my quality is gonna be more consistent, okay? So if you look at the Apple TV spec, the new Apple TV, you know, Apple TV 4, I think, that's what they call it. Now, it allows for 2x capping rate, so you can double your encoding bitrate, but only for VOD. For linear content, the most uh, variation you can get is still 25%, which is not really very sufficient. To get the most benefit out of VBR encoding, you should get at least uh, 2x, sometimes 3x or 4x, depending on the content, but 25% is not really very flexible. Now, uh, so we don't really use more bits, but we use the bits more carefully, and we get better quality. Now, generating VBR encoding, encoded segments is easy, that's what people have been doing for a long time, especially for satellite and cable. But streaming them is not. There is a big difference between these things. And uh, another paper we wrote in 2014, uh, we had this concept of consistent quality streaming. So let's say I have a 2.8 megabit per second link, just for you know, fictional. I have four representations, one, two, three, four megabit per second, right? The naive client, which we have, uh, you know, the largest amount of population right now, is just gonna do, okay, 2.8 megabit per second. I cannot uh, sustain it, so I'll just stick with the red segments, right? That's what it's gonna get. And even in this case, the quality is gonna vary, right? A bit smarter clients are gonna figure out, okay, hey, look, this is two, this is three. If I ask for one from here and one from there, it's gonna be 2.5 on the average, so I'm gonna be okay, right? Well, you can do that but it's not really for sure that this guy is gonna get better quality. It might get even a worse quality or worse experience because the quality is maybe now more varying, right? So it's not really always a better approach. But if you're a smart client who can understand the complexity you know, uh, of these encodings and what bitrates and sizes uh, they have, uh, quality levels they have, it can try to trade off the easy segments with the difficult segments. If it is uh, really something not important, it will ask for a lower bitrate, but if it is something important, it will ask for a higher bitrate. As long as you can keep your buffer in a healthy condition, you are good to go. That's what we implemented in 2014, and that was really uh, you know, uh, a nice improvement. And now we are seeing uh, some of these deployments in the network. Now, if you cannot control the clients again, like talking about HLS clients, right? Let's say now 3.2, 
just to make the uh, example a bit better, the main client is going to do, OK, I'm just going to stick with 3. I have 3.2. I can stick with 3 all the time. But if you have an intelligent packager or origin server now, remember, the client is still naive. doesn't know anything about the quality levels over here, right? This packager might do something else. So the server or the packager replace some of these 3 megabit, uh, megabit per second segments with the 2 megabit per second ones, or even the 1 megabit per second ones. Because why? Maybe there is really no quality difference between this one and this one. To save bandwidth on the network, the server might uh, give you a lower encoded bitrate. Now, we are not able to improve the quality over here, but at least you are saving some bandwidth. And that's what you can do on the server side. So you get bandwidth savings. Now, if the content is VBR encoded, if it's a new content and you are doing this uh, uh, in a green field, let's say you have different quality levels, quality level 1, 2, and 3. And then obviously they have different bitrate uh, encodings, right, for different segments. Again, 2.8 megabit per second network. The smart client, obviously my client is not going to work here. Uh, it's the smart client. Uh, it's going to try to stick with the same quality level as long as it can based on the, uh, you know, uh, throughput available from the network and the average encodings available and the cap rates available from the uh, metadata information. So how this metadata is supposed to be transferred to smart clients? Well, there are a couple of different ways, uh, which I'm not going to get into in detail right now. Uh, one extension to this is, okay, I can do this temporal optimization for a single client. You know, I have simple segments, difficult segments, and so on. But what if there are also, you know, what if I have also variation in different channels? You know, we are a cable operator. We have lots of thousands of channels. And there are sports channels, there are news channels, and there are channels that nobody watches or nobody cares, like C-SPAN, right? You don't want to really give the same bandwidth as uh, ESPN to C-SPAN. So, you, you want to do some sort of optimization over there too, and depending on the audience, depending on the content itself and all that, you might want to get uh, you know, different level, uh, levels and different bitrate ladder designs for these. And that's something I discussed in a more recent paper in 2016. Well, that's it. That was a quick end, but yeah, I'll, let me make it a bit slower. That's it. All right. That's my website. You can see uh, all the paper, find all the papers and other tutorials, which I, for example, I gave another one last week in San Diego, which was a day long, which has a lot more other stuff than this one. So you can, you know, grab those slides as well. So I would like to thank all these guys. Some of them are in the room uh, for providing some of the content. Thank you. Any questions? I'm testing if this mic works. It's a little loud. It works. Just speak loudly into the mic. Ali. Yes, sir. I'm going, I'm going to challenge you this time. Sure. So in the telecom industry, especially the mobile networks, there is a new technique called uh, throughput guidance, right. which is network operator are informing OTT provider, e.g. Netflix, that there are some issues in some part of the network. And based on API, the OTT guy is going to decrease the bit rate of or remove some of the manifest out of the yeah. sorry, profile of the manifest. Have you started to look at this type of technique? Well, that's what we call as a server or network assisted streaming. And that's again, you know, very similar to part five. But yes, we have done quite a bit work in that area. Uh, for disclosure, I really don't like people or the service providers who mess up. Uh, mess with manifest files? You know, it's done by the content provider. They just inform them there is a problem on the network. Well, still, don't mess with the manifest files. That's not really the right way of doing it. You can provide or convey that information in other ways. So I believe Netflix is doing the right thing by encrypting the manifests, uh, which I support. But uh, uh, Server and network assistance, yes. Wherever it's available, especially in base stations, we are seeing more and more uh, stuff like that, as you mentioned. I'm not familiar with the exact concept that you are mentioning. This is the mobile network, yeah. yeah. That's Netflix uh, over mobile. OK. So uh, I'm sure 5G is going to bring a lot of other features. 5G is opening right? the spec, yeah. So, uh, but then who's going to decide what kind of throughput I should be getting again, right? My wife versus me. I mean, it's... Uh, That's you, you decide. But uh, mm. what's interesting is that you see that the network operators are starting to discuss 
with the OTT content providers, and they are not slaving so anymore. A good move, right? I think it's probably good for the industry that those two are talking to each other, since one is carrying the network and the other one is pushing the traffic. Just I skipped a couple of slides, but I hear uh, exactly the same slide that's discussing this, but I think it's in a hidden slide. So uh, you can, you are welcome to look at the. 5G or? Okay. I think it's a good, good place to discuss about those challenges since I understand cable operators are going to dominate the planet on 5G. <laughs> okay, other questions? Yeah, Lee, uh, great and educating lecture, thank you. Um, one comment about the latency in, in, in soccer, f football. Uh, I used to be a football fan and now I, I, I'm cured. The thing is, <laughs> the thing is, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, the thing is not that the, you, you hear the neighbor screaming goal. You need you need to understand the nature of a soccer fan. Well, if he doesn't see it live, he cannot impact the score. He is wearing his lucky T-shirt. But if you don't, if you give him the streaming delay, he cannot impact the the, the players now. Yeah, okay, so this is how they think. So uh, try to get into their mind. So, uh, how many people watch the World Cup final over OTT? Oh boy, this is the wrong crowd. In addition to what? <laughs> yeah, and uh, the question is that uh, um, we, the Netflix uh, network, as mentioned, we have a server, Melanox, uh, we have a server with Netflix streaming 100 gig of adaptive streaming. And it's good for you. Yeah, but uh, what I, I, I want to uh, add to Thierry's uh, comment, I think a, better, a, a nice approach would be to combine the knowledge in the client and in the server. So if the server now serves 1,000 cli 1, clients, he has a wide manifest, and if he serves 10,000 clients, he reduces the manifest, so he doesn't expose the high quality ones. No, again, I don't agree with that approach. Okay. That's it? That's it. <laughs> that's the, as, as that's we can the, see, that's this the is wrong way of doing it. it. That's the wrong way of doing okay. it. Um, I just want to make sure we got people in the back. Anybody in the back that has questions? Yes. Okay, let me take them first and I'll, I'll make sure I come up to you. Uh, by the way, um, we, uh, according to the schedule, we'll need to, um, we have a break at, until 10.20, but the questions, I think, will probably be used. So, who, is the, who had the question back here? Don't push too hard. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Ellie, thanks. Um, so folks in this, um, in this crowd might not be aware about next generation broadcast standards. And so, you might not be aware that um, the next generation ATSC3 also uses DASH. And it actually uses uh, UDP over IP and, and sort of data push concepts. So, that may be worth being aware of. And I just uh, want to give a big shout out to our colleagues in the DASH IF who worked very closely with ATSC to uh, develop an interoperability point and, and the basis for the ATSC standard. So, check it out on the ATSC website. It's open published standard. Thanks. Thank you. Take one more question back here. Ali, great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, could you share some comments on the impact on other traffic? So, we talked about video here. Right. but. These networks are converged, so we're supporting things like you know, VPNs and VoIP calls. Can you share some thoughts right. on that? So uh, the streaming client behavior uh, when you are doing adaptive streaming over HTTP, it seems to be uh, mostly elastic to other types of background traffic like FTP, torrent, or uh, you know, telepresence, uh, Skype, that sort of thing. So that's not really the main uh, pain point. The main point really comes from the other video traffic that uh, follows this kind of paradigm. Yeah. Yep. So can I ask a question? And so you talk about ABI algorithm, the, the comparison. To, I guess most of them are designed for VOD. Uh, are you aware of any work in the like live uh, ABI algorithms? Well, the main problem is uh, a lot of people think that a single algorithm is going to work uh, everywhere and in every case. That's the thing, uh, in my opinion. And uh, what I do in my own client implementation is, you know, you know, have different modes. You know, it could be a low, low latency mode or relaxed mode, that sort of thing, and then that really changes the, that should change the behavior of the client, and uh, I believe that's the right way of doing it. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, if 
a Netflix client might be really perfect for Netflix, but it may really perform very, very badly for life. So it's very, very easily the case. Yeah. Okay. Uh, give a round of applause to uh, Ali.